I'll show him is there, Cliff. I think that might be Dr. Sinclair. Dr. Sinclair, is that you? Yes. Uh, okay. Let me start in about 30 seconds. Okay, that's great. Hey, um, <clears throat> will I be able to share my screen? I think uh, I think there's a way that the participant can share. If, if not, MD has a set of slides that I want to share. Okay. Uh, you, you, this is only going to take about five to 10 minutes, right? Uh, less than 10. Okay, good, good. Okay, not, not that I'm crunching the time. It's no, I completely understand you have an important agenda you need to follow. Uh, well, good morning, class. Uh, to, to start today, we have a couple of Mechie uh, mechanical engineers from Dow Chemical who are going to talk to you a bit about a petrochemical tech elective that's been offered this fall. I'm going to have Mohammed come here and set it up so they can show stuff. And in, India, I'll I'll share with that one slide deck. We'll cover both what Michelle and I want to want to share. So if you just give me share privileges, then then I'll share for both. Yeah, just one second. Can you please try uh, uh, try your screen? I, I just yeah, I just uh, open that option. The multiple participants can share uh, simultaneously. Yeah, I can see your. Yeah, perfect. How about that? I'm a master of technology. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I hear there's a few people who are still joining, but we're a couple minutes over. So um, should I go ahead and get started? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So uh, good morning, class. Um, and uh, thanks for thanks for having us here. Just wanted to share with you um, some some details about a technical elective that we've offered a couple of times now, and we'll be offering again in the in the um, uh, in the fall. Uh, the name of the class is uh, is uh, petrochemical process equipment. Um, we'll give you a little bit of an overview, let you understand where we're coming from, uh, you know, why this uh, this class came to be. Um, I want to share a little bit more, a little bit of detail on the uh, on the syllabus, uh, who's lecturing, um, a couple of key points there, and then then Michelle is going to give you a flavor of some of the things that uh, that we'll teach and, and why that's important um, for someone. Uh, well, any any uh, uh, an engineer coming through any of the degree programs that uh, that we're aware of, because um, you know some of the applied. Uh, Technology is something that's not well taught in, in any of the university programs. It, it, why, why we're doing this is summarize, summarized by one of your classmates who, who took our first class. He, he sent an unprovoked uh, email back to me and uh, he told me he didn't mind me sharing it. <laughs> um, but but he, he, he saw what Michelle and I saw, which is that LSU does a fantastic job of preparing you with the fundamentals, but there are uh, there is a tremendous amount of technology which is applied. And, and, and unless you're exposed to the applied engineering, uh, it's, it creates a very steep learning curve. And what's more, when, what you find that learning curve is not always facilitated by people who are experts in the field. You learn from who is available to share the information with you. And those people may not always have all the details right. And so th it is our objective to teach you what you need to know if you're going to go to work in the petrochemical industry. Uh, that, that is our objective and everyone in this class um, is enthusiastic about it. Uh, all of the instructors are enthusiastic about it because they had the same experience as Michelle and I when we graduated and, uh, and, and found that we had still had a lot to learn. The syllabus reflects that and in fact, uh, one of the biggest challenges with the class is, is uh, arriving at a syllabus which is achievable. Um, this, we had many topics that, uh, that we had to remove from the syllabus that, uh, because uh, of, of a, you know, in the interest of time. Um, and, and clearly the focus in, in all of this is on the practical aspects, but, but there are uh, certain requirements that the university uh, has for the, the class to, to satisfy uh, as, a, as a technical elective. And, uh, and, and so clearly there is some analytical uh, that, that, uh, that has to be part of it. 
I'm going to blow through the lecturers very quickly. Um, it, it, the, the Tom Bradley is a retiree from Dow. Um, Roger Markham is a, uh, a, a proprietor. Uh, he's a, um, uh, has an engineering uh, company that he started himself. Mike Giot worked at uh, Stress Engineering. It's a very uh, uh, well-respected uh, engineering company in, uh, in Baton Rouge. Uh, Cliff Hay uh, started in Exxon Mobil, Baton Rouge. Uh, Cliff Hay does heat exchangers, and he's, he's now located in, uh, in Texas, but travels back for the class. Uh, Charlie Cook at uh, Audubon Engineer Engineering. Uh, Barry Thrasher and Kyle Wooster at CDI, uh, again, a, a well-respected uh, company here in, uh, uh, in Baton Rouge. Another Dow person, Mike Danton, does electric motors. Uh, another Exxon person, Tim Poirier, does uh, seals, power transmission, and, and couplings as well. Uh, Donnie Lambert at Olin, didn't have a picture of Donnie or Dale Cox from Shell. Um, and then, uh, and then Michelle Guidry. So I won't steal her thunder, but let me just suffice it to say that Michelle does, uh, does the gear section. We thought it was great to have Michelle in here, this being machine design. And, uh, and, and she has just a fantastic, uh, uh, you know, repertoire of, uh, of physical things that you can touch and feel and, and, uh, and get a feel for. A uh, couple of key points I wanted to mention, um, is, uh, yeah, each of the lecturer has created a set of PowerPoint slides. So some of the early feedback that we got is, hey, good information, but we need a book. There is no manual for this. So the PowerPoint presentations that we created, um, that is the manual. And that's, that's uh, you, you know, the documentation that you take away from the, from the class. We do start with a, a, a visual. So, so we go out to the power plant so you can actually see some of the equipment, look at some of the PNIDs and make those connections. Uh, because that's the, you know, that's the, the, the uh, one of the, uh, you know, biggest challenges that, that new engineers face is making the connection between the, the virtual and the physical. And then, uh, you know, we've responded to plenty of other feedback, the availability slides early uh, in the semester so, so they can be printed out and then continuity with regard to the homework assignment. So we've made, we've made some tweaks. We've te taught the class two times already, and I'm, I believe that the third will be the, the best, best yet. Michelle? Sure. Um, so mainly what I wanted to, to talk to y'all about was, you know, what happens after school? Um, so, you know, once you graduate, if you go to work uh, out in the industry, you're typically gonna fill a maintenance engineer role. Um, that role is the day-to-day -day firefighting or troubleshooting for the production facility that you're in. Um, they can come to you with problems, anything from uh, stationary equipment, exchangers, piping, vessels, uh, to anything rotating, pump, compressors, anything like that. And, and you're expected to be able to help troubleshoot and solve the issue. So right now, where you are in school and, and for the most part, where you are in your, in your career, um, you really don't even know what it is that you don't know yet. Um, I will promise you that LSU prepares you, like Cliff said, with the fundamentals but the practical knowledge is something you're gonna learn once you hit the door at whatever job you get. So there's tons of additional knowledge that you're gonna to need to be able to perform your role. Now, if you're saying, well, I'm not going to work in the petrochemical industry, I'm gonna to go to work for um, CDI or for Bacon and Davis or, or something like that, or in an improvement engineer role, it doesn't matter what role you're in, you're gonna to need to know this stuff. You're gonna to have to have that technical knowledge of you know, being able to know what a pump is, what it does, things like that. Next slide, Cliff. So some of the things that new engineers typically come to me on um, when they need help or they need a resource, um, mechanical seals are a big topic. Uh, there's lots of mechanical seals out there. They're, they're prone to failure because uh, they are the weakest link in a pump. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of mechanical seal issues. Couplings is another thing that we're not really taught in school. Um, and then cross-sectional drawings is another one that I do a lot on. So if you'll click one more time. So with mechanical seals and couplings, what we first have to start with with a new engineer is what even is this device? And what does it do? Why do we even have it? Next one. And then what are the various arrangements of them and when to use each one? Mechanical seals have a plethora. I mean, doubles, singles, back-to-backs, gas seals. 
there's a use for each one of those and you need to know when to use it and when not to use it. Same thing with couplings. You've got gear couplings. You've got elastomeric couplings. You've got flexible discs. When do you use each one? Go ahead. For mechanical seals, there's typically some sort of support system for the seal. What does that look like and how do I troubleshoot that? Next one. Couplings, how to properly install each type. It depends on how it's made. If you don't install it properly, then it's not gonna do its job and it's gonna cause additional issues. So you gotta know what you're dealing with. And then cross-sectional drawings. I know we have in the curriculum, um, the, the drafting course where we, we draw things in three dimensions, we draw things in two dimensions, but a cross-sectional drawing is a little bit different than that. And I find a lot of new engineers really don't understand how to read them. Next. So being able to see the equipment in your mind is, is critical to me. You have to have an intimate knowledge of how the equipment is built and how it's supposed to work to be able to adequately troubleshoot it. And you need to be able to see this equipment just by having verbal descriptors. So what I mean by that, if you'll give me a click clip, I've got a person calls me up and says, hey, I've got a pump that has a seal leak. All that tells me is the broad topic at which we're gonna be talking about. So I ask them, okay, well, what kind of pump it is? And they'll tell me, it's a Gould's 3196 MT. I have a visual in my head. I know what that pump looks like. So when you give me a click, that's what you need to see in your head. If somebody says, I have a Gould's 3196 MT, you need to be able to see that pump already. Next. They tell me, okay, this has a double mechanical seal. Again, give me a click. I need to see something similar to this. Now, usually we get held up right here because they don't know how to read the cross-sectional drawing. They don't know where the stationary faces are. They don't know where the rotating faces are. They don't know where the fluid comes in and out. Um, so normally we have to take a break and, and step away and understand cross-sectional drawings. Keep going. So then they tell me it has an API plan 53. That's the support system. So the next thing I need to see is that right there. Now, with all of those pieces of information, we can actually begin to troubleshoot what their problem is. But until you have all of that information, you can't adequately do the troubleshooting that's required from you. So what this course is gonna do is it's gonna give you that, that look, that look into, you know, what does a pump look like? Um, maybe not necessarily what they're called, but what does it look like physically, the different types of seals, the different types of plans. Um, it's just gonna give you that step ahead. So when somebody comes to you and says, hey, I've got a pump with a seal leak, you know, you're a little bit ahead some, of somebody who hasn't seen all of this. Next slide. So just real quick, some closing remarks here. Internships are great. And if you've had an inter internship, I applaud you because they are very critical and very important to, to not be in that, that total newbie when you hit the workforce. Um, I do know in the COVID environment that we've had today, a lot of those internships have turned virtual. So basically you're not out in the plant. You're not able to see that, uh, the equipment installed, you're not able to get that education. Um, so spending a semester with us is gonna expose you to equipment that you haven't seen before probably, or that you haven't dealt with to this level of detail. It's going to give you the knowledge and the vocabulary to participate in troubleshooting discussions with coworkers. And guys, what I mean by vocabulary is there's a whole nother vocabulary out there that you have to learn to be able to talk in the industry. It's, it's words that we don't use and it's words that are going to, you're going to have to have that visual on when people say it. Um, so again, spending a semester with us is going to give you several steps ahead of your hiring peers. Um, you know, go back to the, to the unprovoked email from, uh, from Mason, you know, he really saw the advantage and was able to actively participate in discussions a lot earlier than he expected to. So. Sorry, was that too fast, Michelle? <laughs> no, it was good. All right, all right, folks, that, that's all we had. Uh, I, I think we're already over our, our time a little bit, so. Uh, thank you all very much for having us here. And um, I, I mean, it's going to be the class will be available, um, I, I believe, on Sunday when uh, uh, when registration opens up. And um, if you have 
any of your um, uh, any any of your um, uh, advisors, uh, professors who are advising you should know about the class. Um, but specifically, Keith Gauthier uh, has been our uh, sponsor, so he has the, the the most detail. If you want to reach out to Keith, uh, and through him, you can also reach out to me. All right. Thank you. Um, let me endorse what the two speakers said. It's uh, in, it, it's appropriate for universities to teach your fundamentals. Uh, by and large, you don't get taught much in the way of fundamentals when you get out and practice. But that does mean, and, and Michelle's completely right, there's a language of engineering which you have to learn. I think getting internships is a really good way, and you could certainly entertain taking this course to try and get that. I would also say uh, we're going to do a few more applications towards the end of this class. Okay? But the focus on this class has been on fundamentals because that's this is about the only place you can get that. Uh, much more so than industry. And the other comment I would make is it, it's quite true that, that when you get out and practice, what you're often doing is putting out problems. You need to get to know your technical people, in particular some of your technicians will know how to do some of this stuff and, and get along with them well, respect them. Okay? But the other thing you can do is try and improve plants too. So if you've got a plant that's running smoothly, you don't want to just sit and wait till a problem comes along, see if you can't make it better. But the world that's going to take understanding of the engineering application and the language that goes with it. And so that's what you want to, want to get. We'll just return to some of these fundamentals now. We'll go back and look at, <clears throat> I'm going to go back and we'll start doing some more fatigue. At the end of today's class, I'll talk a little bit about test two. So we were talking about SN curves for bending steels. And we had several. Thank you, Sinclair. We're going to go ahead and check out now. Appreciate yes. it. Sure. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you, guys. Uh, the low cycle this is in the range of one to a thousand cycles and it'd be pretty much general acceptance of that flow cycle so when you're out there people are going to call that low cycle most of your, your phases are on high cycle but occasionally get low cycle <clears throat> this is the maximum steel <clears throat> sorry, maximum stress and bending then becomes the strength for that particular steel. And it starts off when, when this is one, then you'll be at the ultimate strength. And then S, sorry, go around the wrong way. S is going down. And when you get down to F, S, U, then you're at 10 to the three. And we had in the last class, F was 0 0.9. <clears throat> I fitted just using logs in, and this is the result we had, although well, it's a slightly different form. Three over log F. Log of 0 0.9 is about minus 0 0.045. It's less than one, so it's negative. <clears throat> you divide 0.05 into three, you get about 60. The number I had here, let's see, what is it? Yes, 0.046. So in the last lecture, this number was 65.56. And I encouraged you, when you have exponents, to use four figures. <clears throat> that was the situation, the low cycle. I'm going to introduce this F because we're going to talk about different other ways of having alternating stresses and F's going to change, but the value for bending was 0 0.9. This is going to be our range. There's very much general acceptance of, of a million cycles as being high cycle. And there's some less acceptance near a thousand. But this is, this is our range. So this is all going to be high cycle as far as you're concerned. When you get out and practice, you may find some other transition fits in here. 
for this S varies from FSU. Where it was at the end of here. It's going down and it goes down to the endurance limit. You get SN from testing. <clears throat> when you're doing this testing, uh, the standard test for indefinite life is 10 to the 8 or 100 million cycles, okay? Um, and it's been found that once you get to to a million, that you don't get if you keep the the strength where you've got a million cycles, you keep going, then you get up to a hundred million cycles. And at that point, the test stops. Okay. So one of the reasons why you don't always have this is that sort of testing can take a long time. If you were doing a thousand RPM, okay, and you have a uh, uh, hundred million um, cycles, you've got hundred million minutes, that's about two years. <laughs> okay, so you can go a bit faster maybe, and you can put this test in the background and so on. So oftentimes you don't have tests that find your SN because they take a long time to do because they run to 10 to 8 cycles. And so if you for being the SN is approximately 0.5 SU. And of course, SU, you can get SU with a simple tension test. So the time for testing is a lot less. When you fit this, which we did, here's the fit, but I'm going to put F in here instead. Can you scoot your paper out? Yeah, sorry. Okay. This is what we had before. You know, if you have. Um... Is that a S times SN at the top? Yes. That's S times SN. Okay. This is SN over FSU. And so if you took this approximation, and you took our 0.9, then that's log of 0.555 recurring. Which is about minus a quarter. And the, and the number we had was minus 11.75. We also had a 0.9 here. And definite life, we're saying is greater than 10 to the sixth. So as I said, as far as steel is concerned, it's greater than a million cycles. The tests go to, to 100 million to establish this. What indefinite life really means in practice is you don't expect to have a fatigue crater. So if you can get to here, fatigue's gone. Okay? There's a cost of getting to here, and that is you have to make reduced stresses. Typically, when you reduce stresses, you add weight, and so on. So it's not always possible to get to here. But if you can, uh, and if you're in the petrochemical industry, then by and large, adding weight's not a big deal. If you can design things there where you get <clears throat> stresses so that N is greater than 10 to the 6th, then uh, you shouldn't have fatigue problems. 
I say shouldn't have because there's quite a bit of scatter in this data. So for this, you want S less than SN. So a big part of designing for this is to go get these SNs. And these SN in the more test are just what I said. They're approximated as half the ultimate strength for steel, okay, or from or from testing. But there's some other th factors that affect that affect this, which we'll deal with. So first step. Let's talk about other types of fully reverse loading. Fully reverse loading is just what we got in the moor. Let me really make that clear. So sigma mean is zero. We'll deal with sigma mean not being zero, but for now, let's just focus on this case. And here's a summary. Now this is all done from measured things. This is phenomenological. I'll give you these values. When you're doing problems, or for that matter, when you're taking the next final, okay? you'll be given these sort of numbers. You don't need to remember these. In practice, after a while, if you keep working in a certain area, you'll, you'll remember them, but you don't need to. So here's the loading. There's bending, which we've done. In the interest of keeping the notes short up, I want to denote that would be there are two others. Axial A. Bending is the most, most common by far, because you have rotating shafts. When they rotate and they transmit a torque, the torque is not varying, but the bending stress is constant. But the rotation means that the, as the surface rotates, it sees an alternating bending stress. Axial, when you have a connecting rod or something like that, you get some cyclic axial stresses as well as bending. Torsion, arguably less common, but nonetheless, there are, are times where you have a, a ratcheting mechanism or something like that, and, and you have alternating torsion. Then F, well, F we had for bending was 0.9. Okay. It's for axial, it's 0.75. And for torsion, it's 0.72. So when you, when you do fit these SN curves for these tests, you get different points where you go between low cycle and high cycle. Dr. Sinclair. Yes. Um, you might have said this before, but this vibration, uh, do vibrations count as part of this uh, cyclical loading uh, yes, for failure? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I didn't discuss vibration, but um, vibrations typically are bending. Okay. Yes. And so if you have something that's fluttering, sorry, no, that, the chances are that it's bending. It may well, it's, you don't necessarily have these things by themselves. These tests were all done with, with this uh, loading just by itself. And so sometimes you have a combination okay, and then life starts to get more complicated. So when, when you have vibrations, for the most part, you're looking at bending and fluttering and, and most, most of this, but you may have axial as well in, in vibration. You could have a, a fluttering uh, flag pole or something like that, which is in torsion, okay? And it, vib and it started vibrating a lot, then you get you get torsional stresses. So vibrational stresses definitely 
a shift expressive and, and they're potentially a fatigue problem. Now, if you can keep the stresses low enough below the endurance limit, then it won't break and you'll be fine. But if you can't, you've got to get the fine up life. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. And so the SN estimate for these Well, here it was 0.5 of SU. It's a little bit less for axial. You can see, you know, so that it's more difficult to make axial last indefinitely. If you think about it, that doesn't seem physically unreasonable. When, you, when you're bending things, it's just the outer edge that sees the stress. And then you have a gradient that introduces the pressure going. With axial, the whole thing sees it. And so you've got a bigger sample of material seeing it for the same size diameter anyway. And so that you could expect the endurance limit to go down a bit. For torsion, this is not so obvious, but it drops quite a bit. I think a part of that is as follows something we've already covered. Steel is a ductile material. Okay? And as you put in shear stress, you promote yielding. And yielding is what locks up dislocations eventually in the thing fatigues. So to some extent, torsion is the worst case in terms of having an endurance limit. These values here, are they're not identical, but they're consistent with table 8.1. Dr. Sinclair, is that 0 0.29 SU or 0 0.39? 0 0.29. Yep, let me write it a bit bigger. So it's about 60% of what it is in bending. Just to reiterate, that's only for steel, correct? Yes, yes. All this is for steel, okay? We will, we will talk a little bit about aluminum, okay? Those are two. And then, of course, you. so all, all these numbers are, have been found experimentally. So whatever material you're using matters. It turns out, fortunately for us, that all steel more or less line up with this. When you get out and practice and you've got a certain steel, you, you may find these numbers change a bit. But these are, as far as you're concerned on this course, these are numbers for steel. And they will not be too bad for other steel, okay? They won't be too bad. I've seen enough of this stuff to say these are not bad numbers. But you, you may end up working with, say, uh, 4340 steel exclusively at the high strength steel, hot rolled condition, and, and they may give you actual numbers where they've done the test, okay? and you'll have to change it. But as far as this course goes, these are the numbers. And it is just steel, okay? But, but we're lumping all steels together which works reasonably well in practice. So that handles other sorts of loading. But there's some other things that influence this whole process. And predominantly, you want to try and design, say, below the endurance limit. So we're going to look at other factors influencing the endurance limit, if you can. We have one factor here is the type of loading, but there's some other things. So here's a shopping list. So the SN, that is your endurance limit. It's a bunch of factors. CL is loading. We've seen that. We'll, we'll reiterate that. CG is called a gradient factor or a uh, size factor. CS is a surface factor. SN prime is an initial candidate. 
And then if you have a stress concentration, there's a KF. So we'll deal with these in terms. Let's start with this candidate, SN prime. You get that from a more test than bending. This is that's what we had before. Otherwise, you always prefer to get it from a test if you can. It won't be wildly different from this value. <clears throat> but more often than not, you don't have it. So CL, the subscript stands for loading. B is bending. A is axial. T is torsion. CL is one for bending. 0.9 for axial and 0.58. And these two are consistent with what, what I gave you just for him. If you take 0.5 times one, you get that. Okay. If you take 0.5 times 0.9, you get 0 0.45. 0 0.5 times 0.58, you get 0.29. So these are just reiterate what happened here. Let's look at CG. Since standard size that more tests have done it, and then if you can increase the size, then uh, you get more imperfections and you tend to promote fatigue. That's what's going to happen here. So, this is called the gradient factor. That's what's called in the book. And I'll, I'll try and discuss these two different names. But let's just talk about it as a size. If you increase the size, the number of imperfections goes up. And so this means that SN goes down. As you increase the number of infections, you're, you're going to reduce the endurance strength. Conversely, if you reduce the size, the number of infections goes down and the SN goes up. Okay. This is a little bit similar. I don't know, I don't know how well it, you can see these demos, but when I pull a piece of the paper with a, a large crack in it and with a small crack in it, when you small crack after a while, you don't always know the cracks there. When you have a piece of paper with a hole in it and you pull it, it breaks at the hole. In fact, it'd be made and the hole is big enough, it'll break at the, at a, the ultimate stress divided by the stress concentration factor almost exactly. As the hole gets a bit smaller, it'll still break at the hole, but maybe not at that lower stress. And then eventually it, it can't even tell the hole is there. So as, as things uh, get smaller, they strengthen. And the reason they strengthen is because the uh, you've got fewer imperfections that are reducing the strengths from their theoretical values. That's what basically happens. So while this is called in the book, the gradient factor, and I guess by having a subscript G, you distinguish it from the surface factor. Okay, There is some gradient effects here that when you have uh, bending, then you've got a linear gradient. So the, the highly stressed part is, let's say 90% of the maximum stress. That's just the, the outer 10% of the radius. So the gradient plays a role in, in determining the size. But the dominant thing going on here is size. And, and so here are, here are some values. We're going to have a range of sizes. And the first range is what the Moore test typically started doing. Don't 
diameter less than 0.4 inches. up to two inches. It's unusual to have specimens or shaft much bigger than than, uh, than two inches, but the range here is four inches. It's, it's not impossible. And this is C, G. So this is where Moore started doing, so there is no size effect here. Now what's happening is he's increasing the size, so SM is gonna go down, and this is what happens in bending. For axial, uh, the whole thing, there's no gradient axial, so the whole thing is, is a bit bigger in the sense, there's, there's a bigger part of the material that's seen uh, these imperfections, so it drops. Now there are some books who say it's, it's one for this because there's no gradient. Well, they're losing sight of the fact it's a side factor. So this is the value you'll take. Again, these are the values we'll use in this class. And this goes down. And torsion is basically the same as bending in terms of side factor. Not supporting the surprise, it's a linear gradient in the stress and the nominal stress. Again, when we do problems here in class and when you do problems in the problem set, you'll just use this table. This is uh, fairly consistent with table 8.1, but I went and got some other numbers here. So this, this again, is okay with table 8.1 in a book, but 8.1 tends to give you ranges. I'm gonna give you specific numbers. And I got these from other sources, although they are consistent. Surface, this thing here is a surface factor, surface finish factor. Now, as you look at the surface, I think it says it's been turned and machined. You will find, perhaps you can't see it, but it's been done carefully with your naked eye. But if you get a magnifying glass, you find little wee ridges. And those little wee ridges act like very small cracks and stress concentrators, and they promote fatigue. Okay. And if you polish it and get it smoother, then it gets even harder to see these. And so there's less of a factor. If you <clears throat> perfectly polish it, then the CS is one. That's good, mirror polished. It's a gleaming piece of steel. In practice, you seldom get to that. You get more in a range of This is more like a lab. This is this is more common condition practice. Then the most common thing you face in making a machine, and there's a serious factor here. Down at about to five, reducing your endurance limit by factor of two. Sorry. Within these ranges, the value you get depends upon the hardness or the ultimate stress.
There's a relationship between these two. For the machine, is that 0 0.8 or 0 0.6? Sorry, so 0 0.8. The KFE machine moves into commercial polish. And you can relate, if you give them the hardness, HB is the Brunel hardness. If you just divide it by two, you'll get the ultimate strength. Well, here's where you're going to get this. We'll get this from the book. And uh, we'll look at this in a little more detail later on. So this is figure 8, 13. And you can see mirror polish is basically one, unless you're getting very, very hard material. Very, very hard materials um, don't tend to yield as well. Uh, and, and so their ductility is reduced. And, and so they become a little more prone to fatigue. Um, this is machined. It goes from 0.8 to 0.5, as I said. Okay. Oh, mirror, mirror polish is, is one. I'm sorry, I, I meant commercially polished. It drops off after it's about 0.9. Then there's some hot rolls and as forged and so on. By and large, you don't operate down here in mechanical engineering if you have fatigue as a problem. You'll go and either grind it to get back up here, <coughs> or uh, it won't be down here in, in the first place. It'll be machine. And so we'll, we'll look at this figure in a little more detail later. So we're going to get these from the book. The last factor we had here was this KF. This is the fatigue stress concentration factor. So KF is related to KT, the stress concentration factor as follows. You can rewrite this. It's somewhat informative to write it like this. Stress, stress concentration factors are always equal to one plus an increase delta KT. That's why, why the stress is contracted. So this is always positive. KT is always bigger than one. Okay? And then what this Q is telling you, how much of that increase do you get? Or you can have it like this. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So if Q equals one, then KF equals KT. And it's not just sensitive. On the other hand, if Q equals naught, then KF equals one. And you would say it's insensitive to the notch or the stress concentrator.
So Q here is a not sensitivity factor. Does that range from zero to one or is it zero to yes, one that's or range. zero that's or one? Sorry? Is it zero or one or the range? It, it ranges from zero to one. Okay. Okay. Let me put that down. It is a, a strict factor, it's dimensionless. Okay? That's the way we normally use factor. You would think the following, that as the notch radius, the notch or the step down or the fillet radius. Mm. Then that Q would tend towards north. That as you get very small notches, again, it's all size effects. As you get very small notches, after a while, they don't matter that much. On the other hand, the notch radius is large. Then Q would tend towards one. What does zero and large mean? It means compared to atomic dimensions, more or less. When the notch radius starts getting smaller and smaller, then this will eventually go to zero. It will go. And a large radius doesn't have to be very big before you see some serious uh, notch sensitivities and Q is not that different from one. And again, we're going to use the figure from the book. I'll show it to you. And this is the way these things look. This is going to cover my notes for a moment. So here's this notch radius, and you can see Q is continuously going down. It also depends on the hardness or the ultimate strength, okay? The notch rays in inches here and in millimeters here, and it, it comes down and then it turns down relatively quickly towards the end. Very seldom do you really get something down to zero. So there is, in the testing, there is some sort of notch sensitivity, but it's, it's significantly reduced as you get things smaller. So when you start to use all this stuff, it, it's a little bit of a, shopping list of looking things up let me let me set up an, an example and then we'll take a break and we'll do the example but these things as far as you're concerned are all material properties these values they happen to be for steel but they're material properties and so this is not stuff that you would write down on formula sheet or anything like that okay. so here, here's a here's a first example So here's the situation. I have a shaft with a step down. And so it's going to have some stress concentration. And the torque is varying. In fact, it's going to be fully reversed.
Okay. Here's some specs. The outer diameter. Let's say 24 millimeters. The inner diameter is 20. I have a radius here. Oop, that's not very clear. R1 is the maximum radius I could put in as a step down, because I have the lowest stress concentration. But what would that be? That'll be big D minus little d divided by two. 24 minus 20 divided by two will be two millimeters. But for some reason, for some sort of clearance here, I had to put a smaller radius in here, R2. We'll see what difference this makes. And so this R2 is 0.8. It's a machine steel. It has a hardness of 150. What's R1? Sorry, R1 is, is two millimeters. Okay. 24 minus 20 is four. And so that <clears throat> half of that is the biggest radius you can put on there, which is two. And it's gonna have a Fresnel hardness number of 150. We'll have a safety factor of two. For indefinite life, that's not an unusual number. Sometimes a bit higher though. Then the question is, let's find out what we can put in here for indefinite life. We're gonna get two different answers. And of course we would have to take the lower one to make the thing happen. So I, I just wanna see what the effect of this radius is on these answers. It might turn out that this radius, we could avoid it, or at least tell somebody what it's costing them in terms of the allowable torque of having that tight radius in there. So we'll solve this after, after a bit of break. Are there any questions on that? Uh, for that uh, cyclical graph, is that torque max? Or yes, that's like torque. Like tau, okay. Yeah, T, T max, okay. And it's fully reversed. It, it goes to plus T max and minus T max. It's got no mean value. Okay. It's funny, really. It's a little tricky to think of. No ready example comes to mind where we have a fully reversed, but this will serve to demonstrate how we use some of these charts more than anything. Okay. Normally, when you get um, alternating uh, torques, there's usually a mean value. Okay. But with, with, to keep life simple for an hour, we've got a mean value of zero. We will later on address what to do when you've got a mean value. Any other questions? Okay, well, let's take a break for five minutes and we'll come back and solve this. But it's, it's, these problems <laughs> are a bit like going shopping. You have to go find data in various places. Like that. And, uh, and we'll go do that. And then that's what you're gonna have to do to solve the problems in problem set seven, which will be posted later this afternoon. Okay, take a five minute break.
Dr. Sinclair. Yes. Is our uh, homework being posted soon? I see we have one due next week. That's right. It'll be posted this afternoon. Okay. And the the first couple of problems are the same problems on in the problem set six, but we didn't get to those. I think. Yes, yes, the first two are the same as on problem set six. Then there's another three problems. These problems tend to be a bit longer than some of the other problems. So I've got slightly fewer on the problem set. They take a bit longer going through and finding the stuff. Conceptually, I don't think they're, they're particularly difficult. But the first time you see anything, it always takes a while to get used to it, to get comfortable finding stuff. Okay, let's do this example. So the allowable shear stress here is that it's a value on the outside. <coughs> We've been calling it tau t when, when, uh, due to torque, okay? And that has to be less than the endurance limit divided by n. Endurance limit gives us indefinite life, and this is the safety factor. Tau a, it's a mm, cylindrical specimen, so it's 16. It's going to be the torque times 16 divided by pi d cubed. We put these two together, then the allowable torque 
is pi d cubed divided by 16 times tau i, just this. Tau i is s n. On 16 n. So problems like this all come down to what's this? What's s n? And the number of factors going to affect this end is the size of the specimen, the loading type, okay, uh, the loading type first, the size of the specimen, um, <clears throat> called the gradient factor, okay, and then there's going to be these notch factors, okay, there's also a, a surface finish factor. So, so this SN determination follows the shopping list. So we're going to have to go through and determine each of these. Sn prime is just a half of the ultimate stress so we'll start with that then we'll do this 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 and this And the ultimate stress is the Brunel hardest number divided by two, it's 150. So that's 75, but that's in KSI. We this is in SI units. One megapascal is 6.895 KSI. Sorry, KSI is 6.895 megapascals. I've got this backwards, sorry. One KSI is about seven megapascals. Let me let me just rewrite this in different line. You want to think of a simple number in your head. One KSI is seven megapascals. So SU then is seventy-five point six point eight nine five. Five one seven. So this n prime is just half of that. D five nine. So that's that guy. Doctor Sinclair, isn't it yes. uh, 0.55 times ultimate strength? Not one half. This is, this is point 0.5. Oh, yeah, my bad. Sorry? Maybe my not, not very clearly written, but that better? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So now we need to get CL. Well, here's the CL, the torque is 0.58. So we can get that. And we want to get CS. So we've got this. But we want CG. We can get that from this list too, from this chart or table, I should say. So the diameter here, but you have two to choose from 24 and 20. It's not going to make these are ranges, it's not going to make much difference. This is about a little bit less than one inch, and this is a little bit less still. So it's all about one inch. 
So it's going to be in this range here. On the other hand, if it happened that this was in one range, a smaller uh, uh, range, and this was in another range, you choose the bigger one to be conservative. As, you, as D gets bigger, these factors go down and you get less of an endurance limit. So if you have a choice here of either of these Ds and it makes a difference, pick the bigger one. In this case, it doesn't matter. They're both about um, a little bit less than an inch. So they're both in this range. So for torque, it's 0.9. We need to get the surface finish. This machine. Sorry, what was that? Well, I said just been looking up to, you here to get these numbers. This is machine. Let's see if I can use a different color. Let me figure out. The cat of uh, tensile strength in KSI 70, 75 KSI. So that's about here. It's machine. So we go up to here. And it looks like about 0 0.78, 0 0.79. Again, to be conservative, by my eye, I could perhaps get a rule on measure more accurately with a magnifying glass. Um, it's not really worth it, but it's somewhere between 0 0.78 and 0 0.79. So I'm going to take 0 0.78 because that'll be conservative. And now I need to go get KF. Well, first of all, I got to get go get KT. Okay. You can get that from the book. This is stuff we had earlier. Figure 4.35. That has a step shaft that has it under bending, axial, and torsion. Torsion is figure C. When you go get these things from charts given in the book, then you have to use their notation. The notation happens to coincide with the ones I've used here. So D upon D, but make sure that this is the case. It's 24 upon 20. It's 1.2. Okay. And then R upon D. Well, it's, we've got two cases here. R1 upon D is 2 upon 20. Or R2 upon D. 0.8 divided by 20 is 0.04. I didn't make a copy of this chart, but we can go get it from here. There is a D upon D, it was 1.2 and we have 0 0.1, we just go straight up here. It looks like a 1.33, something like that. Point 0.1. Yeah, 1.33. Uh, for point oh, 
four, bring up the chart. more than 1.6. Then we have to go get Q. Notch radius in millimeters two. Brunel, Brunel hardest number 160, uh, 150. This is 160 and 120. So I'm going to take that value. Okay. So this would be mm, 0 0.8. Then when the radius was 0.08, this is 0.75, there's 0.08 there. It's getting a bit hard to read this. Sorry, I should bring it up. This is uh, 160. This is 120. And linearly interpolate between those two. And get Q. Point seven two. Doctor Sinclair, what table is that that you're using to find Q? Sorry. This, what this is the table that you're using right there to find Q? Q. This is the Q table chart. Okay. I'm not sure if I answered your question. It, this, this is a chart. I, I, I showed you this in the book. I copied this out of the book so I could start. I think he's asking what figure number it is. What is? What figure number is it? What what? This is figure eight twenty four. I'm still not understanding your question. Yeah, that's what I, I think. That's what he was asking. Figure eight twenty four. Yes. yes. Thank you. Sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. <clears throat> okay, and so you can get this out of the book. It's the same figure number in, in both books. Okay, both editions. Okay. And th this you, you could do with linear interpolation between the two. It's getting a little hard. You know, it's not worth spending too much time here and you want to be conservative. So if you pick Q to be on the high side, then you're making it more notch sensitive and that's being conservative, okay? So when you have some doubt about what the value of Q is, then, then take it up a little bit. So now we can go get KF. Okay, it's just one plus 0.33 times 0 0.8. 1.26. Whereas KF for the sharper radius, 1.64, but it gets reduced by a little bit more, 0.64 times 0.72, 1.46. This is what was going to happen here. We'll, we'll get back to the problem in a second. This here is, is pro, approaching a factor of two in the increase in stress. Forget the one. Don't take the 1.64 divided by 1.33. The increase in stress is 0.64 divided by 0 0.33, 1.94. The increase in stress now, once you have a notch factor, is not as big as that. 46 divided by 26, 1.77, okay? So it's always gonna go down a little bit. If it gets small enough, it can go down a lot. So now we can put this together.
and let me do uh, well we've got to see how I'll, I'll just read out what we had 1.58 for torque CG 0.9 from that table both from the table CS from the chart from the book 0.78 I had. Yep. Okay. Then SN two fifty nine. So SN for R one. I just multiply these together. Sorry, it's not very well written. Hey, uh, Jack Cement, your mic is unmuted. Sorry. It's 83.7. And likewise for R2, you could just call this 84 at this point. We get 72. So we can go use those then to get the allowable. Talk. It's going to be it's SN. Come on. the format has been removed. It's going to be the smaller D, which was 20 millimeters, 02 meters, times 83.7 or 84, times 10 to the 6 to make it Pascal. And this is about 6.5 Newton meters. And if we change this to 84 to 72, that's going to drop it by 72.84, that drops it to 5.7. Okay. So the, the tight radius, that does mean you can't take as big a um, torque. Oftentimes what you're doing here, instead of finding the allowable torque, given the dimensions, you're going to find this D cube. And so this, this sort of drop in torque when you have a D cube will not make the thing very much bigger. So the cost in terms of fatigue of having the tight radius is not huge. I mean, this radius is 0.08 compared to two, a uh, factor of two and a half times less. And Yes, it does hurt you a bit. You would use a slightly bigger um, diameter, but it won't be much bigger. Okay, if you take the cube root of the ratio of these two, this is not what we're doing here. We, we're picking the allowable stress, but more often than we are going to be doing the the design thing. Then that's a four percent increase in diameter, and you're going to have certain standard diameters for these shafts anyway. Other thing, so that's that's not that big a deal. And that's partly because of the Q effect. Any questions on that? And so this is what the problem step will look like um, in problem set seven. Okay, you'll be going through and looking these things over and just use this table that I showed you today for CG and C, um, CG and CL. And then otherwise use the charts in the book. 
But what often happens in practice is you don't have fully reverse loading. So let's talk about what we're going to do about that. So overall, our resources for the homework should be table 8.1, table or uh, figure 8.13 and 8.24. Yes. The, 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 well, you, if you have a KT, you have to go get KTs from that part of the book. Okay. But yes, the, the, the key, the key figures for you to use. Are the um, surface factor, which is figure 813. And the Q factor, which is figure 824. And then this lecture will be posted and you can also use this chart table, okay? And, and th this is reasonably consistent with the book. Okay. It's just I'm giving you specific values so you can just pick them okay, from here. I think this is completely consistent with the book. Um, this is fairly consistent. They, they give you ranges in there. I was giving you specific numbers, a little bit easier to use. That's all. Okay, thank you. So, what often happens in practice, you don't have reverse loading. The more test 100% reversed. And that's the biggest source of data, without a doubt. But in practice, we often have a mean stress. So let me talk about bending. So this is the, the situation looks like this. It's a bending stress. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> we, we're going to have a constant amplitude. And that's quite common in practice. But here you have a mean stress. So here we're going to define the alternating stress. So that's, that's the alternating stress, half the difference between the max and the min. And the mean stress, of course, will be the average of the two. And when, did, when we did the Moore test, Sigma min was minus sigma max. So sigma A minus minus sigma max, be two sigma max divided by two was just sigma max. That's consistent with what we did. And of course, sigma M, sigma max minus sigma max is zero. So this is consistent with what we've done in the past. It's just we're going, we're going to allow sigma M to not be zero. The way we'll deal with this is called Goodman's diagram. Again, the focus on definite life.
So on the y-axis, we're going to put plot the alternating stress. And on the x-axis, the mean stress. This is not the scale. <clears throat> the alternating stress, if you didn't have any mean stress, the highest you could get to would be SN for indefinite life. Okay. If you didn't have any mean stress, that's just the more test. Then on the other hand, if you didn't have an alternating stress and just had a single mean stress, you know, the most you could get to would be SU. So typically, no, it's not too bad a scale. This is about a factor of two bigger than this. Then what Goodman proposed, and what's used in practice to this day, is that if you keep below this line, you get indefinite life. Okay. It's a good piece of engineering. When you go up here, this clearly works, so that point's right. If you go out here and you've got no alternate stress, this point's right. Then the simplest thing you can do as an engineer is draw a straight line. Okay. So that's what he did. Now we can get a safety factor out of this. Suppose we're at point one. We have sigma M1, sigma A1. Let's say those are the actual mean and alternating stresses. So if that's the case, we, we have a definite life on the Goodman diagram. And in fact, this works pretty well. The data supports it. We can go see what the safety factors. We've got a wee way to go before we hit this line. So those would be the limiting values. I'm going to put a prime on them. Okay. Then the safety factor is how much what the ratio is. How much you feel you've got to go. N is going to be this value, the bigger value, divided by sigma M1. Or if you like, you can do the alternating stress. They're the same by similar triangles. Okay, so <clears throat> this over this, What I just said, sigma A1 there over this, that height over that height is the same as this, this, uh, this length over this length. This length over this length is this, this height over this height is this. So these are the same. And we could go find out what this is. We could plot a line through here and make it intersect with a line through here. Then given these values here, we should be able to find out the values for indefinite life and, and work out this quotient. If we take a line through one, then y, sigma a, goes through the origin. So it's just the slope. And the slope of that line is sigma a1 over sigma m1 times sigma m. That's that line there. 
and we can get this this line here. Well, see where A starts off with here when seeing where M equals zero at SN. But it goes to zero when seeing where M equals SU. So if I multiply by that, I have the equation of a straight line that starts off at SN and is zero when SM equals sigma U. Let me just put the light back on. So the intersection is when these two are equal. So in that, that case, <clears throat> The value will be sigma A one prime. It'll be sigma A one times the value of sigma m there, which is sigma m1 prime, right there. And if it's intersecting, it'll also equal this. So let's put these two together and solve for sigma m1. I'll put the sigma m1 prime, I should say, on the same side. Which case would be this sigma a one times sigma m one. This is negative on this side. Back on that side, it's positive. And its ratio is S n S u. That equals S n. If I bring this to a common denominator, be sigma m one S u. This will be sigma a1 times su, sn times sigma m1. And I flip it and put it over here, I'll get the following. So the safety factor. I just divide this by sigma m1, so n So when you have alternating stress, this is what safety factor you're going to get. We could do some checks here. If we have no mean stress, then this will be zero. <clears throat> SU would cancel, and N would be SN from sigma A1. And that's correct. That's just pure, fully reverse loading. On the other hand, if, if we had sigma A1 equals zero, N, this would be zero. SN would cancel and N would be SU from sigma M1, and that's correct. Okay. Well, we'll do an example uh, next class on using. What?
What does sigma A stand for again? So, okay, go back to this. Sigma A. Could you just run through all of the, sure. the new terms while you're at it? Okay, sure. Sigma A is the alternating stress, okay? It's not this minus this, it's this minus this divided by two, okay? And so when we're doing bending, we just used to take sigma B max and say that's the alternating stress. That's exactly what this is, sigma max minus sigma min divided by two, okay? That's the alternating stress. But there is, when we're doing fully reverse, this was down here, and the average sigma max plus sigma min was zero. Now it's not going to be zero, okay? So, <clears throat> so it's a half sigma max. So it's basically, it's the amplitude of the stress. Uh, I'm not quite sure I know what you mean by amplitude. Sigma max is the biggest stress. The, the variation is sigma max minus sigma min. The alternating stress is half of that. The total variation is sigma max minus sigma min. But we always use half of that. That's what we use in the more test. We just use half. Okay. So it, it would be the amplitude of that sine wave, right? Well, sigma max minus sigma min would be the amplitude. Half of that. Oh, well, I, I guess I, if you write it down as uh, A sine omega t, yes. Yes, it would be the amplitude. Yes, fine. Yep. Yep. If, that, if you write, write it down as a sine wave, that's correct. Okay. And so, and sigma m is just the mean value. And what Goodman said, it, it, it makes good sense. He said, look, if you don't have any mean stress, then if you want indefinite life, you keep below SM. So he said, down here is fine. Okay. He said, conversely, if you don't have any alternate stress, if you keep below the ultimate stress, then you have indefinite life. Okay. If you put one load on, you might yield, but you, you won't break the thing. Okay. If you go up here and you don't exceed SM, it'll keep cycling and never break. Okay. And then he just did what any engineer would do. Given these two points, let's, let's just try drawing a straight line. Well, of course, he did this years ago, and, and there's been lots of data since that support this. Okay. And so some, there is some indefinite life that's a little bit higher than this, but this is a pretty good line. So what we just did, there's a little bit of algebra here, which may may might cloud the woods. But if you're at point one, if that's your actual stress, you can see you've got a wee way to go to get to one prime. So you've got some sort of safety factor. And what I tried to show you is, look, we're going to find the safety factor is sigma m one prime is the value up here. This is sigma m or sigma A1 prime is the value up here, sigma A, we're going to define it as sigma M1 prime bigger than sigma M, okay? Or sigma A1 prime on sigma A1. And what I just tried to show you, this point here, in terms of XY coordinates, is sigma M1 prime, sigma A1 prime, whereas this point here is sigma M, sigma A. And I said, these two are the same by similar triangles. These, two, these triangles are similar, so the ratio of this height to this is the same as this base to this base. Okay. Then the rest was a little bit of algebra. I went and drew a line through here. I wrote this equation down. Y equals kx. Okay. That's what that is. That's y equals the slope times x. Then I wrote an equation down here, and I just put them two equal and solve, and you get this expression for the um, for the safety factor. Actually, in practice, more often than not, we're using a Goodman diagram. We just use similar triangles and we don't bother with forms. This form is correct and you can use it and it might be faster for your occasion. But the, uh, quite often, we, we're just going to use similar triangles when we do an actual problem. Does that hopefully clarify things a bit? Are there any other questions? So, so what we're doing here, we're going to find one of the most common loading is, is um, zero one loading, you go from zero to max. That's, that's quite common, okay? And so that would have a mean value of half sigma max, would have an alternating value of half sigma max too. And so that, that's fairly common. Let me make a couple of comments about, is there any questions on that? Let me make a couple of comments about um, S2. Okay, I, I will have, Office hours.
And normally on these tests, um, I give one set of office hours. And if you haven't got any answers, asked any questions during that, then it's game over. Okay, whatever. I, I will extend this a large class. Okay. And that occasionally may have missed a phone call. But you can <clears throat> so I, this but this is it. So any questions you've got about the grading of your test, then I, you need to ask them tomorrow. I would suggest the way to do this is to email me at home. You can use the LSU number, it'll, it'll forward it probably. It's not 100% reliable, so this is more reliable. And then and get, include your phone number. Then I will call you. you. You're welcome to call me. The problem with calling me is if a few students are calling, then you may get busy signal. That happened yesterday. Another so I, I don't anticipate there will be many more. Most of you had looked at the work solutions and, and they were very sensible questions. A couple of you have skipped that step. You're wasting your time to ask me a question if it's already in the work solution, what the answer is. So you want to look at that before you call. And if you've got any, any further questions, give me a call then. I think I'm going to talk with Mohammed today. I think we've located most of the people who had missing names. And I'm not sure, but we had two tests that came in where the thing had been magnified and we couldn't grade them. And there's another student's test that we're, we're looking for. Um, so I'll report back to you. Then any adjustments to grades will be made next week. And that'll finalize this. So if you have any further questions on test two, uh, contact me tomorrow. But I, I recommend you email me the part of the test that you've got the question about so I can look at it. Then when I call you, I already have an answer for you. That'll be faster, okay? And um, and give me your phone number, okay? So, I, but if you want to call me instead, that's okay. All right. Any questions on that? Okay, there's room for some improvement in, in this stuff, but I warn you that these tests get harder. There, there's, the material is more difficult than what started off with, and it builds on it. But, uh, So if, you, if you're not doing well, you're gonna to have to change your game plan if you're gonna survive. I will point out one thing. If, if you don't pass this course, what we've done in the past is let you take a summer course at Penn State so you could go and be a senior. Okay? Uh, you still, the summer course at Penn State, uh, I think is not as rigorous as this course so you still need to retake this, but it lets you proceed to be a, be a senior if this is the only thing holding you back. Uh, you could you'd go to your senior year. You would have to redo this in your senior year. That's not necessarily a bad thing. If, you, if you've started to learn it here and you've learned quite a bit of it, when you see it again, the second, for any of us, the second time you see stuff, you tend to understand it better. And plus you've been using quite a bit of this stuff in, in uh, capstone design, or you will have used quite a bit of it. And so, so that, that'll help you too. So that, that's one avenue that you might want to explore if you're having trouble. If you um, want to see me in person to discuss how you might improve, you, you're welcome to do that. Send me an email and we'll try and find a time. But I'm not in here that often uh, these days. So we have to set up a time to, to do that. Okay. Okay, any questions? All right, well, the next example is quite long, so I'm not gonna start. Oh. We'll start, I'll start it next time. Yes, sir. Uh, will you be around for a second? I, I just wanted to see uh, something written out on one of the test solutions that yeah. was. Yeah, if you can come by in the next few minutes, I'll be happy to look at it. Yes. Okay. Um, should I just hop on this Zoom or should I call? Oh, um, oh you're, not, you're not on campus? I'm not, no. Uh, no, you, you better just email it to me, okay? And I'll, I'll look at it. Okay, I might okay. Respond, to you, respond to you this afternoon. Okay. If I get a chance, I've got other things I have to do, but uh, if I get a chance, I'll try and respond to you this afternoon rather than waiting till Thursday. Okay, I appreciate it. Yeah, if you email me at times other than office hours, 
don't necessarily expect a response. There's a bunch of other stuff I have to do. And uh, those people that are involved in that expect me to be doing it. I can't shortchange them. But if I get time, I'll, I'll look at things. Okay, thank you. Any That's other questions, point. comments? Yep. Can we still pick up our exams today? Oh, um, you didn't pick it up? Yes. I didn't know. It was raining all yesterday, so I didn't get a chance to go to Okay, well, you go, go by Mohammed's office um, and uh, send Could I pick it up directly after this class? Would he be there? Yeah, yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll be there. You can try, can try that, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So you, you can try that. Okay. Yeah, he, he'll, he'll be there uh, at, at 10.30. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. But bear in mind, after tomorrow's office hours, that's it for this test. Okay. Uh, there were some very late questions about test one. Well, the week after test one, <laughs> the, the interim president and his wisdom we're shutting down the university um, for safety, what he perceived were safety reasons. Okay. It, uh, uh, some of them I found somewhat surprising, but, but uh, and so we, we got things, I really got a bit delayed. That's not, it hasn't happened this week. And so this week, test two is finished. Okay, I'll see you on Monday. There'll be a problem session on Friday.